And welcome to Astronomy at the Beach, Part 2. This is Saturday evening at 9.30 p.m. We have uh, cloudy weather here tonight, so the observatory is actually closed. But tonight I thought we'd go through um, a little bit about astrophotography and processing data. So the uh, agenda is going to be um, simple setup for astrophotography and some some simple processing. I need to pull up the uh, some information here real quick. Going to go uh, through the, uh, the system we have. Single frame from another. There we go. That's what I want right there. <clears throat> so we're going to go through a little bit about what I have in the observatory. I didn't go through that the other night uh, or last night. And I guess I got this switched to the other side here. I need to change this. I need to swap these. Yeah, hang on a second. We're going to the wrong. Escape. Let's see if I do it this way. Nope. Ah, oh, bear with me here. For some reason I can't get it. Display settings. Swap view and slideshow. There we, there we go. This is what I want. <coughs> So we'll talk a little bit about the observatory um, and what I have in here. Okay, I need to drop this down a little bit. Make sure I'm sharing the right thing. Yep, okay. Hi, Rosanna. Very good. I'm not sure that this link for tonight got on the uh, the website, so I'm not sure we'll get very many people out here. But in any case, um, the imaging system that I uh, was using last night, this is it sitting here uh, with the 10-inch uh, RC Ritchie Cratian, which is about 2,010 millimeter focal length. Uh, lost my DG11 mount with the Gemini 2 control system. The Pole Master camera for polar alignment. I have a uh, ZWO ASI 071 MC Pro one shot color camera. That would be this one here. And uh, it has a cooler on it. And then I have a guide camera, which is another 071. An on axis guiding port, which allows both cameras to see exactly the same field of view. Excuse me a second. Okay, Optech focusing system. Let's see here, I need to share this. There we go. And uh, I have a Canon T3i piggybacked on top of the, uh, the scope. That's uh, got uh, anywhere from a 10 millimeter to 300 millimeter lens that I can put on that. Usually I use that for a wide field camera to see uh, large 
swath of the sky for clouds or just to get multiple uh, constellations in one field of view. Um, sometimes I'll put my 4-inch SCT on there for uh, solar because I have a uh, white light filter for that. I'll piggyback on the 10-inch in place of the camera here. And then I have an Ethernet router, uh, which allows uh, the, uh, the laptop, the Gemini 2, the DS600 hub, and the focuser to all plug into that router. So my laptop can talk to all of them via Ethernet. This is the, uh, one of the ZWO cameras. It has a, a USB hub on top of it. So this is a 3.0 in, uh, going in and then two USB ports coming out so I can daisy chain two other cameras uh, with this with this uh, camera hooked up. All right, that's the Optech uh, focusing system. This is the controller. This is the adapter to the to the 10 inch Ethernet cables, USB to serial cable, power, uh, thermal couple, and they hang uh, a uh, ma manual focuser unit. This with a 10 inch with a four inch or uh, with the four inch on it. This is with the uh, 135 or uh, the 300 zoom piggybacked on there. And then this is the layout for the uh, the observatory. And the way this works is. Uh, The observatory computer runs everything below here through that local Ethernet router. It says telescope mount, telescope focusing system, and the DS600 USB to Ethernet hub. I've got the pole master and a UPS uh, connected through this one. And then the Canon T3i and the guide camera are hooked through that USB hub on the ZWO. Then uh, I have a Wi-Fi security camera so I can monitor what's going on. And then there's a Wi-Fi mesh network from the observatory to the house. And then the house computer, which is the one I'm sitting at right now, can connect to this uh, computer and run the insider system or monitor the entire system. The primary control apps are SG Pro, PHD2, and the Sky X I use it for ad hoc and then focus lock. SG Pro manages all the Automation, PhD2 manages the auto guiding and focus lock manages the automatic focusing. This is the second building I have. Uh, the first one I built in 1984. And uh, this is the obviously the RC that I have in the new building. I had this built two years ago. And that's the observatory that we have in place. I just wanted to go through that real quick. I don't think there's anything else in this that I want to go through other than yeah. I'm going to go through a pro example processing for uh, some data that I've taken in the past. Looks like the, this link is not, uh, not a link that's been published. I'm not, I'm not sure why, but we've only got five people in here. If you could sound off, I'll know who's here. We've got Roseanne. We got, um, uh, oh, geez, Kelly. I don't know who else is in here. Okay. All right. So what I'm going to do is go over um, some quick processing. We'll use uh, some previously used data. Let's do Deep Sky Stacker. I'm going to open up some data from last week. We'll use... Uh, What should I use here? 
AGC 891, taken on the 19th. So these were 10 minute exposures when I was up north. Um, of uh, this edge on galaxy. We're going to open up, open up some darks. Just a minute, I'm getting a text message. Yeah, there's a give me give me a couple minutes here. They're the link that they've got at it goes to yesterday's program, which is already recorded. I got a note from John here. All right, I'm going to have to publish this on uh, Yeah. Um let me um I need to I need to publish this link to this YouTube channel. Hang on a second, folks. I'm sorry about this. They didn't put the second link in. Uh, let's see here. Find it. I need to publish this link to this. Facebook. Public. All right. So I posted it on the uh, my YouTube or my uh, Facebook channel. All right. Let's get back to what we were doing here. Uh, okay. So let's see, where was I here? Uh, these are my darks. Okay, yes, I want to open up these five minute darks. And then I need to open up my flat files. And Great Lakes on the 18th, I think that's correct. Yep. Open up these. So in Deep Sky Stacker, you bring in your. Um, your uh, light frames, your dark frames, and your flat frames. And it will s s uh, register and then stack all of these. I'm going to use 90% uh, of them. Yeah, let's go. Uh, yeah, let's go 90%. So it'll throw and only use the 90 90% uh, best frames out of all these. So it may throw two frames away. And we'll go ahead and start this stacking go, uh, process. So first thing it's going to do is take the dark frames and create a master dark frame. OK, 
Okay. Uh, now it's registering the this the 20 frames that uh, of data that I've I selected. It's registering them. And then it'll it'll decide which of the uh, best frames to use during the stacking process. Hi, Paul. Latitude 62. Yeah, you are up there. Just looking at the comments in the, uh, in the session here. So it's decided to stack 18 of the images. And I use Deep Sky Stacker only for, uh, for stacking. I don't do any other processing with it because it's pretty easy. You just select three sets of files and tell it to go. And it'll create a, a uh, TIFF file as the output, which I'll use to um, bring into PixInsight. There's the TIFF file, and there's the stack. And now I will take that and bring up PixInsight. Stack looks pretty good just to, on its own. So we'll open that up, file open, and we'll go to NGC891, and this is the file we just created. And I'm going to do an auto stretch just to see what it looks like. It's going to be a lot of green because of the debayer matrix like that. And one of the things I'm going to do before I do anything else is I'm going to crop off these edges. And the reason the edges are there is because this object was taken with the mount looking or the scope looking to the east first and then a meridian flip was uh, performed which means that the object went past the meridian and was in the west now so the telescope had to swap over pointing to the west to pick the object back up again. And it isn't a perfect match. If you remember last night's run, I, I tried to get uh, the automation to bring the object within 100 pixels of center. So some of the things I might have to do is crop it a little bit. So we'll just do that right here. Like so. And I think that's good. And then I'm going to do uh, open up one of the raw files. And the reason I'm going to do that is the first operation I do on this will be the photometric color calibration. And to do that, I pull in one of the raw files. And uh, I say acquire from the image. So it just picked up the information that was in this fifth file. That's what this is. Um, the RA, the deck positioning, time and, uh, uh, that it started, the focal length of the scope, and the X and Y pixel information. And that shows up right here. The RA and deck, uh, the date and time, 
uh, the focal length and the pixel size. And I do that so that when I do the next step, it will know where to center it, the plate solve that it's about to do. And hopefully this will work. So I'm just going to press this button. And what it's going to do is go out to a database, if it works, go out to a database and pull out the reference information for this object in the database. The reference information contains all the photometric data for most of the stars and, and uh, in this case, uh, an average spiral galaxy. And it's going to convert the image that you're seeing here to a white balance that reflects the spectra of the stars that are on there. This takes a, couple, uh, a minute or so. <clears throat> Twenty five percent, just about done. All right, and so it is now color balanced it. I'll do an auto stretch on it. So the green is gone, but I now still have some uh, uh, artifacts on the outside, and I use another tool to flatten that out called automatic background extraction. So we'll take that, and we're going to go ahead and subtract the background. And what I want to show you is what it took out were these gradients. See the light gradients, etc. So this is a pattern that it created on the background and it generated a new output file. And it looks like that. So you notice most of those gradients are gone. Okay. So this is the one we're going to work with. I'll minimize this other one. And this is the one I'm going to work with. And I haven't actually stretched it. That was an auto stretch. So we'll start with that and bring up the histogram. Histogram is a way of uh, stretching the data out such that we, we can actually see it. See, there's a little tiny spike over here. We're going to expand this to bring this data out. Expand it a little bit more here. Sort that up. And this is, becomes all art now to the to the user that makes these. You basically decide what you want it to look like. So uh, I think I'll keep it right about there. It gives me some definition in the in the uh, edge on area there. I do have a little more glow over here that I don't remember seeing before, but that's okay. So we'll go with that. In fact, if I wanted to, I might be able to stretch out another. Uh, no, we'll just go with that. So that's the histogram stretch. And then I'm going to bring up um, the curves transformation. And uh, that'll be this. And I'm going to use saturation to bring up a little bit of color. So you notice that the blue stars get bluer and the uh, orange stars get a little more orange and the galaxy gets a little more brown. I can go crazy, see, I can make it look like a cartoon like that. But I like to be a little more subtle, so that's about where I would put it, right about there. Now, with that said, that's the simple processing that I do. I don't do a whole lot more. Sometimes I'll, I'll use a denoise uh, tool 
and we can we can look at that. Let me let me pull out pull up what I I processed this uh, uh, earlier in the week. Let me open up the previous processing. See if I'm even close to being consistent. Okay, so this is the this is what I generated back uh, on Tuesday or Wednesday from this data. So this is what I just did today, and this is what I did uh, last Wednesday, I think, after I got back, because this object I took uh, the data last this is just last Monday. So this is the previous processing, and this is what I just showed you. I think I apparently got rid of some of this other gradient here. Okay, we're going to add this guy. All right. So I'm not going to be, I just shut down my WebEx, that's all. So as you can see, I did it two, slightly two, two different ways uh, than, uh, than I've done before. But this is, this is the final result that I actually published was this one. Okay. So that's what I do in processing, about 10 minutes worth, maybe 15. Pretty simple. Once you learn it, it's not that difficult. But those, it's uh, just a half a dozen tools or so. So do you have any questions at this point? This was going to be a short session. I figured 30 minutes to an hour at the most. And we're already uh, half an hour in. I wanted to just go over what we had in the system and then show you what uh, some processing looked like. So if you have any questions, please type them in the text. Some of the other data that I did take last week, I can go through those real quick. Some of the results from my trip up north. Okay, here come some questions here. Well, yeah, I have a solid state drive. It's a one terabyte solid state drive as my primary. And I have a one terabyte data drive as well. So the programs load fast and the data is quickly accessed. Um, and I have a, you know, pretty fast processor and lots of memory. Um, so the actual stacking and processing, yeah, it goes pretty quickly. So just to give you an example of uh, the week that I was up north, these are the objects that I um, um, worked on. We'll go through them a little, a little bit here. This is the Cocoon Nebula. This was uh, data was taken on uh, September 20th. And it's actually the 19th, 20th, I believe. But this was... Um, uh, six hours of data. Six hours? Twelve, let's see, ten. Uh, yeah, eight hours of data. And uh, these were all 10 minute subs. We got a lot of nebulosity, dark nebula, etc., cetera, in, in this object. So this was eight hours of data. Uh, so we, I spent one whole night on this one. This was the Iris Nebula. This was another 270 minutes. Lots of dark nebula and, and, and other art of, um, details in here. A lot of dark nebula here. This, uh, this is blown out a little bit. So I went back and I processed just that central core uh, again didn't push it as hard, so you can see a little bit more detail in the center and out here. And then this is the, the one we just processed, 891. This has got 180 uh, minutes on it. 
There were three hours of data. So, Brian, um, I don't know if you can get the same results, but you probably can, but it might take a little more time because there's more. Uh, the, for example, the photometric color calibration. That is uh, a color calibration that uh, you, GIMP wouldn't have. You'd have to actually work the RG and B channels to get the color the way you want it. Uh, what the photometric photometric color calibration does is gives you kind of a true color of the entire field uh, that you're using, and it does it in a very very easy way. So I don't think GIMP would give you quite the, quite the flexibility or the ease of, of processing. As you notice, I did this in about 15 minutes. This is a crescent. I only got. Um, a little over an hour on this one, hour and 10 minutes, hour and 20 minutes up, up there. This is the Deer Lick group with NGC 7331. And it's little, uh, what they call the flea galaxy, the fleas, little galaxies here and here and here. That, that one came out kind of nice. And then this is my bubble nebula. This one was uh, 370 minutes. So there were six, six hours. Got lots of uh, hydrogen out here. And then this is the Tulip Nebula. And this one's uh, 190 minutes, a little over three hours. So that was the uh, that was uh, last week's work while I was up north. Any more questions about processing? Actually, I do use GIMP um, sometimes to just do some cosmetic things like cloning out some um, artifacts, maybe if there's some that aren't supposed to be there, but it isn't. Um, it isn't my primary tool. Pix Insight is my primary tool. If you notice what I was able to do in a rather quick fashion. Now, there's a lot of tools in Pix Insight. You know, I'll pull up this list here. Here's all the processes in, in Pix Insight. Just starting right here, this continues down. We're only in the D's. Scrolling down, scrolling down, all the way down to Unsharp Mask. Okay. And then they have them. Uh, organized by various categories, but they also have all of these scripts. And if we opened up all the scripts, we got lots and lots of scripts that uh, do some automation for you. And there's batch processing. So there's a lot of tools in here, and you notice I only used basically these are the most used that I have. I do. I use a comment alignment for. Uh, uh, when I do my comment work, comment allow, alignment allows me to stack on the core of a comment. Uh, blink compare, and I'm looking for uh, asteroids moving through a field of view of multiple images. Image integration will take a um, uh, when I when I do a plate solve for annotate the image. I'm sorry, not image integration. I use annotate image and um, image solver to uh, create a uh, an annotation of the of the object. You know, let me see if I can get this. I'll do that right now and show you how that works. Let's see here, where is it? Image solver, here we go. I already had it, so I'll say OK. So it's going to take this and basically plate solve it. It won't do any. You won't see any show up until I say annotate.
This takes a little bit of time. Okay, looks like we're done with that. Now I pull up the uh, annotate image. Uh, I have all these defaults that I'll use, uh, you know, constellation lines, name and stars, messy, NGC, etc., PGCs. Let's select the PGC so it's on. And now we say go. And it just finished the plate solve and annotated it. So in this field view of 891, there's all these other little galaxies called PGCs. So a plate solved this image that I took, and I have to put the grid on so you have the coordinates and stuff like that. So that's how um, you annotate these objects, uh, or these images, when you, once you've taken them. Um, another example would be, uh, let's open up the uh, Deerlick um, one seventy three thirty one. Let's see, let's see here. There it is. Let's open this guy up. Right. I think this let's see what it might be on the other day. Just look here. Yeah, it's this one here. So we'll open up this one and we'll do the same thing for this one. So we're gonna go to um image solver and we're going to do a search on NGC7331 select that okay new coordinates say okay And these are other functions that you wouldn't have in GIMP as well, by the way. These are all, this software is designed for astrophotography. Let that run for about a minute. Okay, and now we'll annotate it. And there you go. So there's NGC 7331. Now it's identified the other elements of the derelict group here, plus some PGCs. PGC is primary galaxy uh, catalog. So it's got those in there as well. So that's what we've done is plate solve uh, uh, and annotated this object. And you can save these away and publish them as well. Okay. So that's some fun stuff there. Uh, let's see, what else can I show you? Some of the uh, more subtle things are the unsharp mask and the deconvolution. I suppose I could bring this up, bring the unsharp mask up. And I don't use this very often, but sometimes I do. And it will sharpen up the image a little bit. But it does create some uh, noise artifacts in the background. And I think the best way to show that to you is to zoom in here. Actually, this is the original. Let's do this. Let's work on the one way we're going to Yeah, I want to close this. No, that's because I got this crop. Yep. Close this one. Close this one. Close this one. Close this one. Yep. So we're going to work on this one itself. So I'm going to zoom in here. 
you notice the noise, there's not that much noise at all. The Unsharp Mask actually introduces a bit of noise. And we'll look at that. Does make it look sharper, but watch this left hand panel here as I apply this. Yeah, see, it, it does sharpen up the dark lane, but it introduces a bit of noise. So that's a little bit sharper than it, than it was before. And you can adjust that as well. No, I haven't. I have not done uh, 1333. Um, so let's say that I wanted to take this. We'll do a save on it. I'm going to save as, and we're going to save just the JPEG. And I'm going to do this. Uh, I'm not going to save this anyway. So I'm going to just do this out here in the open. save that and I'll show you another tool that I do use from time to time it doesn't apply very well on all objects but in some objects that have been pushed a little bit it does make a little uh, a little bit of difference on the um, on the uh, here we go this one here on the noise floor so let's take a look and see what this looks like So on the left-hand side is how it looks, the, f the file I just pulled in looks. The right-hand side is what some smoothing has occurred. I'm going to hit the auto button, see what it does here. It's going to basically keep the same uh, noise removal, but try to sharpen up some of the image. So when I go like this, you're going to see that the noise in the background is there, and now it's disappeared. Now it's there, now it's disappeared. So it does do a little bit of work on the background noise, cleans it up. And so that looks a, a little bit smoother in the background. And you can just save that away as, uh, as another file. So sometimes I'll use that when the image is pretty noisy and I want to smooth it out just a bit. Yes, yeah, okay, so that's completed. So that's another tool that I'll use from time to time. And if we want, we can take a look at that and compare. Go here. And let's open up this one. And then we'll go to the denoised one. You notice it gets a little bit dark and a little the background gets cleaner. Go back and forth here so you can take a look. It's kind of like a blink comparator. You can kind of see it change. Okay, so that, that's another tool. The Skywatcher HQ, HEQ5, um, for as long as you don't overload it, it'll, it'll work fine. It's a lightweight uh, mount. Okay, so that's pretty much all I have for today. Uh, unless there's some questions I can answer about astronomy in general or uh, astrophotography or whatever you'd like to, to ask questions. And if I don't know, I'll say I don't know. Unfortunately, this link to this, this uh, tonight's session did not get published in the Astronomy at the Beach uh, website. So we won't have, uh, I had like 32 people last night. But this recording this is being recorded. It will be available tomorrow on on my YouTube channel for anyone who wants to uh, review it again. So I'm going to pause here. I'm going to have a little drink of my coffee while I'm waiting to see if any questions show up. Do I hate the moon? Well, um, no, the moon is an inanimate object. I can't hate it or love it, but it does get in the way for two weeks. 
almost two weeks out of the month uh, for ash photography, at least for my, my stuff that I like to do. So yes, it's a, it's a little bit of a pain. However, it does give me a chance to get catch up on my sleep. <laughs> Okay, <clears throat> so if, um, well, um, I don't know. Let's uh, let me look up the um, at uh, that mount. Let me go look it up here. HEQ five. I watch your HEQ, 30 pound payload. Well, by the time you put a scope on it and cameras, um, you probably don't want anything more than about a 15 or 18 pound scope. Because you're going to put about five or five or eight pounds of cameras on it. Uh, especially if you're going to go guide, guiding. Um, yeah, I wouldn't get, I wouldn't put anything heavier than a 18 pounds telescope, primary telescope on it. Preferably a 15, but your William Optics Z61 work fine on that. Your next star four, uh, four inch would work on fine on that. Those are pretty lightweight. In fact, you could use one. I think if you put a five inch SCT, let me see what the six inch SCT weighs. I have a six inch. Let's see here. Da, 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 da. Let's see if it's got a weight specification on here. Uh, let's see here. No, I don't want the eight. I want the six. Why did you take me to this to the eight? Okay, it's this the one I want here. And what's the weight on this guy? Let me look at the specs. Fifteen hundred millimeter. Optical tube weight's only 10 pounds for the 6-inch. So it's pretty lightweight. What was the 8? The optical tube assembly in this one is... Uh, on the 8-inch is 12.5 uh, pounds. You could put the 8 on that mount. Uh, if you want an SAT, you can put that 8-inch on that mount, and then you have to put uh, your guide camera, if you're going to use a guide camera, in a small 50-millimeter uh, guide scope. You could do that. I think the 11 inch weighs uh, 28 pounds, so that's too much. The 8 inch looks like it, it would fit on the on that uh, mount that you're talking about. It'd work fine. Any other questions? OK, 
Okay. Well, I think I'm going to, uh, let's see. Well, it's too, it's a pretty long focal length, actually. Um, a lot of the guys like to get uh, the small refractors, like a 4-inch refractor at F7 or F6, because uh, it's faster for astrophotography. Um, at 8 inches, an F10. Uh, it'll give that eight inch is actually the same focal length as my 10 inch. My 10 inch is an F8, so it's an 80 or about a 2,000 millimeter focal length. That eight inch F10 is about a 2,000 millimeter focal length, a little over. So the field of view with the same camera is about the same as what you would see here. So you could go after galaxies like I did, but it would be, you know, the exposures would be a little longer than if you had an F6 system or an F7. That's that's kind of the defining factor. How how much time do you, do you need to take for to get the same penetration on your exposures? Depends on what you want. Okay, Paul. All right, folks, I'm going to end the stream, and I hope you have a great evening, and we'll talk to you uh, soon. The next time, you again, you'll be able to reference this on my YouTube channel uh, if you want to go back and listen to me babble some more. Um, it will be on uh, my YouTube channel uh, under uh, Doug Bach. Subscribe to that channel, and you can look at all my other videos that I've done. All right, folks? Yep, take care. Have a good night.